Okay, welcome back everybody. I hope you're loaded up on uh, food and coffee and ready for the afternoon session. Um, I'm going to hand over uh, for the introduction uh, of this session to Albert Cañigueral, our uh, friend and partner from WeShare. And he will uh, introduce uh, our keynote speaker from this afternoon. Albert. Thank you, Viviana. Just a short introduction. And, and before introducing Neil, uh, just to explain or to highlight that this is the, the opening keynote of the Eight Days Barcelona. I don't know if you've had a chance to visit eightdays.co, uh, which is the, the website where we are hosting all the information. This event is a, it's a joint umbrella event uh, made possible uh, with the cooperation of different conferences and events happening uh, in Barcelona all of them related uh, with the open maker and collective movement. So it's happening from today, uh, starting with, uh, with this conference until next Monday with the symposium that is at the end of the, of the, of the FAB 10 anniversary. So this is again starting from, from this conference, then we have the FAB 10. This afternoon we have also a Wisher talk at the Mobile World Center at 7. It's also for free. Neil will also participate at this event and I think he will provide some, some other details. We also have the visit to the Big Bang Data exhibition at CCCB. I think it's on the 3rd, if I remember well. And there is an, uh, also a local meetup of the Open Knowledge Foundation uh, Spanish chapter. Okay, so I suggest to visit this 8days.co website or this the hashtag of 8daysbcm where you can get all the information. And uh, for this opening keynote, we, we have Neil, Neil Gorenflow, who is the co-founder of Shareable.net, an award-winning uh, news action connection hub for the sharing transformation. And Epiphany in 2004 inspired Neil to leave the corporate world where he used to work to help people share through internet. Through his exploration, through this exploration, uh, Neil met uh, those, uh, the people who, could, who would co-found uh, Shareable with him a few, few years later. Among other publications, he is the co-author of Policies for Shareable Cities, the first and so far only uh, sharing economy policy guide for politicians that has been also translated to Spanish by, by some friends. Uh, Neil is also an advisor of WeShare, the organization I belong to. Uh, peers, and even the, the major park of Seoul in, 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 in South Korea. Talking about shareable cities, sharing cities, he will be, he will be talking about that. Uh, so he will, he will uh, explain what he found on the journey with us uh, during his talk. But uh, even before that, during this weekend, I had the chance to be with him and he gave me this nice book. It's called Society 3.0. Uh, Mastering the Global Transition on Our uh, Way to Society 3.0 from uh, Ronald Bandenhoff, a very recommended book. And I was inspired by a paragra paragraph that I would like to share with you before uh, Neil introduced uh, his talk. So it's basically to, to frame these eight days and this conference. We are at a turning point in our society, which is not obvious to everyone, but a point in which we will go all through. This juncture reminds me of Copernicus. Around the uh, year 1500, he, positioned, he, posit he posited that the planets revolved around the sun in his heliocentric theory. In doing so, he contradicted mainstay public opinion that the Earth was at the center of the universe. But Copernicus struggled with his theory because it undermined the fundamental values of religion, science, and the political and royal powers. Probably that sounds familiar with some of the topics we are discussing here. My human-centric theory revolves around the human being. In particular, the organizations revolve about, around the human being. This means there is a new spotlight, a new frame of reference, which means that manufacturers, service providers, or society as a whole no longer have the leading role in the events that shape the world. It's a time to change, it's a time to make a U-turn, it's a time to take responsibility. So, welcome, uh, Neil Gorenflo. Uh, th thank you, Albert. <clears throat> Let's see if this thing works. Oh, there we go. Okay, we'll start here. So on a sunny Saturday morning in uh, June 2004, I, uh, I left my uh, corporate hotel for a jog in the uh, normal path that I took in this industrial park outside of Brussels Airport. And uh, I was 
working very long hours and doing a lot of travel for work. And I, so I headed up the hill from this hotel. And uh, at the uh, top of the hill, at the first turn, I stopped in the uh, parking lot of an abandoned warehouse. And something unexpected happened. I began to cry. And uh, I thought to myself, what am I doing with my life? I'm, I'm never going to realize my creative potential. I've, I don't have any power in this, uh, this corporation. I, I can't control my, my, own, my own destiny. I'm losing touch with uh, everything that I love, my friends and my family and, my, and, my, and the cool projects happening back in, in my home. Um, and my life started to f uh, flash before my eyes. And I, and I saw every, all of my struggles to get to the point where I was in that parking lot, and a thread uh, connected all of them. And I, and I felt and, f uh, and saw this so clearly for the first time, that that thread was uh, that I had been doing life as if it were a solo performance, as if I was on my own, um, and I felt deeply lonely. And with that loneliness, was a helplessness, a hopelessness, a desperation, and, and even, even shame that I wasn't part of anything, really, that I believed in. Um, and I also recognized and felt at that moment that, you know, I was very, very far from being alone in that condition, um, and that millions felt and maybe more, and, and maybe in much worse ways than this pampered office worker. Uh, I, f I felt that, see, uh, that others felt that same searing pain that I felt, and it was really uh, overwhelming at that point. So I, I, for a private moment, I walked off the, the roadside to the side of this warehouse, and I, and I knelt down and just wept and, you know, just asked, you know, what can I do? What should I do? What should I do? I was really desperate for a, a change. And, I mean, at that moment, there was uh, no answer. Um, but I took the opportunity to take a vow and to, you know, try to create a different life and world. You know, just humbly one person was what I could do. Um, and a world based on sharing where it's easy to find love and community, meaningful work, build great relationships, and have good conversations every single day. And uh, so I, I got off my knees, brushed them off, and I ran back to my hotel room, and I sent in my letter of resignation um, and got the first flight back uh, to San Francisco. Now, when I... Uh, when I got back to San Francisco, uh, well, this was a really unexpected turn in my life. I had the, I'd never had an experience quite that, like that quite so powerful. Um, uh, I, I had a lot of commitment, but I didn't have a, a kind of plan. Uh, but I knew that if I wanted to create a, a life and career uh, based on sharing, that I couldn't do it alone. <laughs> so um, it, it needed to be you know, based in community. Uh, so, uh, my friends and I uh, created uh, a monthly salon we called Abundance League. And, uh, you know, 30 people once a month for three hours. This is something we did actually for five years. Um, and, uh, and it was kind of underground and small on purpose. And uh, the, the idea of the event uh, was to create uh, an experience like for, you know, one evening. Um, where people could be their most generous self, uh, they could practice sharing, and I think most importantly, like, live into a new narrative, um, one in which when people, when we help each other, when we share and when we collaborate, uh, then we can, uh, there's enough for everyone, and we can create the kind of lives uh, that we want, uh, that are deeply meaningful and rich. And... Um, the, the, the salon worked uh, like, uh, had a very simple structure. So it was two parts. It would be a gift circle and then um, a speaker. And the, the, uh, the gift circle was really the secret sauce uh, of the event. 
Um, everyone sat in a circle and got um, one minute to say three things. So first, um, say what their passion was or their project uh, for the common good that they were working on. And, you know, the, the, the event, what, what we were trying to attract people who were working on kind of sharing projects, projects that created abundance. So what is your, you know, common good project or, uh, or your passion? And then two was... Um, what is it you need to move your project forward? And three was, what could you offer other people in the room to help them move their project forward? So what skills or connections or help, you know, even money or uh, recommendations, connections, y you name it. And, and uh, so everyone would take their turn, and then at the break, everyone would match up their gifts and needs. And um, even in a, a relatively small group, uh, the uh, amount of connections that were are found between people was all, always amazed me that that it was uh, uh, readily apparent that what you had um, there was going to be at least you know two or three people who could use um, what you were offering and and vice versa that you could get support for your project so um, about eighteen months into this uh, my you know my my uh, I started to feel like I was living in a different reality, like I was becoming, uh, living in the world in a different way. And, and, and this had to do with this network that uh, m my friends and I uh, built. And um, instead of, you know, chasing after opportunities and trying to force uh, fate in my favor, what, what, what started to happen was that my future started to come to me so that opportunities would flow to me, and they would flow to me in really unexpected ways that couldn't be planned in the normal way, and, um, and there would often be things that um, were better than I could ever imagine or ask for, and, um, and a lot of times I didn't have, even have to ask for them. But the fact that I had helped hundreds of people on the projects that meant the most to them. That's what we're really trying to get people to find. You know, what is it they're really, really interested in doing in the world? And, and let's help each other on those most important things. So it, it, this little um, experiment built an incredible network uh, based on purpose. So the connection uh, was purpose. And, and, uh, and so when you help a dozen people or 250 people uh, like that, then um, you have incredible social capital. And, and, and life starts to be a kind of adventure, almost magical. That's what happened for me. And, and um, uh, you know, I experienced uh, wealth, uh, a different form of wealth, and that wealth that uh, comes from relationships, not money, and a different form of security uh, based in community and uh, uh, mutual respect. Um, and this is a kind of security also that money can't buy. That it's much better. It's a, it feels uh, much better. Um, and, and also, I think, practically speaking, is better also. And for the first time, I, you know, I felt like I was coming to my own. I mean, I was like in my 40s and, and, uh, um, and finally on a path, I felt to becoming, you know, a more fully realized human being. And this was um, incredibly important to me. I, I guess, in a way, at that point in my life, on that, in that parking lot, I was sort of took a stand and said, like, I'm not going to compromise on um, uh, a, a life where I don't become fully human, where I can't, you know, uh, I, don't, I didn't want to uh, reach the end of my life and have, you know, this mountain of regret about all the things I didn't do and the things that, and the kind of and the kind of person I didn't become, right? Now, um, I'm going to switch. So, uh, Abundance League went for five years, but towards the end, you know, there was kind of a problem, too. So, it, it, it was um, successful in, in, uh, in many ways, but it eventually fizzled out. And one of the, one of the, reasons why was, you know, this was expensive San Francisco. A lot of the people that, including myself, that were, um, you know, coming and participating or even organizing it, 
it was just hard to do with, uh, you know, to do anything extra except like make money and pay rent. And uh, the, the economy in San Francisco, and I think overall for Americans, is kind of stacked against us in many ways. And, and some stats I just want to point out kind of highlight this. Um, the U.S., I believe it still ha we, we still have the largest economy in the world. China is going to overtake us in, I don't know, days or months or something. But, um, and, um, but our social indicators are just really low. So among the, the 20 biggest economies, the U.S. has the highest income inequality, homicide and incarceration rate, the highest carbon di dioxide emissions, the highest water consumption, the highest uh, spending on, on health care and the lowest life expectancy, and also the worst scores on um, the UN indices of child well-being and gender uh, inequality. So in the U.S., you know, and this is the feeling that I get, and you know, that, that uh, you know, everything is really kind of sacrificed on the altar of, of economic growth. Um, that the space to do new things and uh, to become human, to work together as citizens is closed off, really, in some ways. I mean, even with Abundance League, it was hard to find inexpensive uh, space to hold our meetings. We were always having to beg and hop around. And, you know, we did it sometimes in people's homes. Um, and uh, unfortunately, you know, most of the world seems to be following some version of the script, a very similar script. And there's mounting evidence, you know, see it in the news every day of, you know, global warming and um, the, how the economy is really unsound and how these uh, crises and combine it with social crises, how they could combine for something, um, you know, even up to uh, a kind of civil, a collapse of civilization. There was a, a NASA st study recently that, uh, that uh, said that it was, you know, highly likely based on their analysis that our, our global civilization would collapse if we didn't change, change course. And, and, you know, that's actually, you know, historically the norm is that civilizations normally do collapse. Um, so the upshot for me uh, was in this experience um, was, you know, the, the life and the uh, and world that I vowed to try to create um, you know, it was just a lot more complicated project. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it had, there had uh, something more ambitious, more sy you know, systematic was needed, more uh, comprehensive, you know, kind of needed an, an entirely new economy, um, one that people controlled democratically and that dramatically re reduced resource uh, consumption and opened up time and space for, for people to work together for the common good and for a better future. So in, in 2008, I began working on a, uh, with a small team on Shareable. And that's the site, um, shareable.net. It's uh, the nonprofit uh, I lead today. And we're the um, world's uh, most visited, visited website about sharing and the sharing economy on the, on the web. And we also do uh, community organizing. So we're, uh, the purpose is to you know, uh, catalyze, strengthen, uh, and build a, a sharing movement. And we do a lot of work with partners, including, including WeShare. Um, you know, we thought, you know, this is around 2008, and, and uh, we thought the Great Recession was the perfect time to start uh, a sharing movement during, during the re research phase of the project. And I'm a very, uh, I'd say, relentless researcher, um, and I really immerse myself in what I, I kind of it, at the time, it, f it felt like a startling discovery that was, um, if I had been a, half awake, um, would have been completely obvious. Um, and, and, you know, and what I learned was that there was already a huge sharing movement underway. In fact, a movement is probably too small, you know, doesn't do what's happening enough credit that it's a, a kind of uh, a transition or, or uh, a transformation of... I think of epic scale, and um, so you know. Bottom line is, we didn't really need to start a movement. That that was kind of our initial goal. We we needed to shine a light on this transformation and connect people to it, um, invite them into it. And you know, the the public had almost no recognition of it at that time. The you know, it was just 
you know, if you read the newspaper the, and the, the popular media, mass media, that that's all is, that is talked about is everything that's going wrong. And, um, and this can be very depressing and corrosive to civic society. People withdraw when they see things are not really working, but it's, it's um, usually like only half the story. And that's what I found is that there was something emerging that was uh, very promising that was gonna you know, replace or augment this broken system, right? And uh, I started to see, also in this process, I started to see the, the world differently. And this became the basis of our editorial point of view at Shareable. Um, and and I, I saw first that uh, we already shared enormous wealth in the commons, that, that we were kind of ignorant of the, the riches that were all around us um, and saw the, as a society, at least the United States, uh, um, saw the future of society as a kind of half uh, a glass half empty rather than half full. And um, the other pieces of this is that saw clearly that a shift from a top-down factory model of society to a peer-to-peer -peer network model was going full steam, accelerated by the Great Recession. And also the new network technologies and smartphones were becoming super ubiquitous. And uh, we were starting to reorder the brick and mortar world in the image of the internet, and especially in cities. And, and I saw that a new social contract was emerging to replace the broken one between citizens and state, one that embed, embeds a, equality, authenticity, openness, sharing, and, and collaboration in peer relationships. And that a whole range of production technologies were becoming accessible to ordinary people, um, enabling them to create products in a way um, that only large corporations could do just a few years before. And that a new path was kind of opening up, that we could pursue, instead of pursuing prosperity through growth, which obviously is, wasn't working out, um, and it was becoming more and more clear that that strategy is not viable long term, we could do something um, very different and, uh, and also very practical. We could seek prosperity through sharing. And nowhere you know, uh, the last piece of this is that, you know, I realized that nowhere is this shift more important than in cities because, you know, today we're a connected urban species and more people live in cities than don't now. And that's a new thing, only, uh, you know, two or three years old that um, we've been uh, an urban species. And, um, and the future kind of hangs uh, this 21st century that is, a, is the urban century. And our future hangs on what kind of cities uh, we, we create or design. So from the beginning, Shareable published our articles that told a new empowering story um, and, and really uh, uh, about the economy and, and focused on cities. Um, we, uh, some of the work we, we did, pioneering work we did, um, we held the first summit exploring cities as platforms uh, for sharing, so a kind of sharing economy on, and cities conference called Share San Francisco. That was in 2011. We invited, you know, city government officials and business people and entrepreneurs and plus NGOs all together uh, to explore that theme. Um, and uh, from that came a collaboration with the city and we helped them launch their sharing economy working group uh, uh, in 2012. And that got huge inter international uh, attention. Um, and uh, although San Francisco hasn't followed through uh, much on what they were planning to do, uh, it did inspire, for instance, uh, Mayor Park of Seoul, Korea. So they, they launched um, later that year, in September, a, uh, their Sharing Cities in initiative, which is the most ambitious sharing uh, economy agenda in any city of the world. So they really have resources and teeth in this project, have multiple pillars and streams of activity. They have a, a you know, Seoul is 10 million people and they have a, a 60 person um, innovation team, which in San Francisco, I think they had like two staffers uh, working on the sharing, the sharing kind of agenda. So, um, in 2013, we published uh, Policies for Shareable Cities and that was the first sharing economy guide for urban leaders, but Albert mentioned that. And you know, this was kind of a, the other thing we did was launch the Sharing Cities Network, which is you know, bringing together local sharing leaders and our goal is by 2015 to have launched 100 local sharing movements. So this is kind of a promising start. I mean, this, it's just 
one step or two steps. I mean, there's such a, a way to go to create sharing cities and, and for them to realize what, what I think their potential is, is as engines of social transformation. And so we really um, need to rethink and redesign them and do it fast. And, you know, the, the first step here is actually to tell a new story about cities. Um, you know, we need to see cities as commons and not markets, as, as places for people uh, to make their lives together as peers and not simply as places to buy and sell, not as engines of the global economy as um, the uh, key, you know, infrastructure to, you know, make the GD GDP b bigger, right? And, and we need to design them as uh, transformative spaces, spaces that enable people to co-create the most important product in the world. And, and, uh, and this isn't, you know, a car or a building or a process. Um, the, the most important product in the world is, is to build beautiful, fully realized human beings and that are compassionate, creative, resilient, loving, capable citizens, each a true genius in their own way uh, a, a, and a genius that is brought out in a deliberate manner by a, a community of peers. And I think in this way we can um, recover, expand, or ignite um, more of the sacred nature of cities and keep, uh, and keep the profane at bay. Because the, the, the kind of society I described uh, you know, in the United States, uh, everything is for sale and it's all, all profane and the sacred um, is very scarce. Um, and, but this is a new kind of sacredness. This is not religious. Um, it's, a, uh, it's, a ci it's civic, and it's the sacredness found in the space between peers who work for the common good, um, who design and create and build together. And, the, and the, uh, the real product of that process is beautiful human beings. The byproduct is architecture or engineering or um, the typical objects of, uh, of design. And you know what? What and what's at stake is really our future. I mean, we, uh, you know, what are we going to become if we design cities and ourselves uh, as a result as mere instruments to grow GDP? I mean, we'll just lose ourselves in every sense of that phrase and term. Um, and 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 we will be selling ourselves um, uh, in so short. I mean, tragically short. So in. In, um, so I said, you know, uh, if, uh, as a starting place, we have to tell a new story about cities, that they're not markets, that they're commons. And, um, and what is a commons? Um, so there's a great book I recommend. It's uh, David Bollier's new book. It's called Think Like a Commoner, and it's a, a nice primer on, on the commons and, and uh, can get you up to speed. But I'll, I'll take from that uh, a quick definition. So a commons is a, a, a social system where the long-term stewardship, stewardship of resources that preserves shared values and community identity. It's a self-organized system by which communities manage resources with minimal or no reliance on the market or state. It's the wealth we inherit or create together and must pass on undiminished or enhanced to our children, our collective wealth includes gifts of nature, civic infrastructure, cultural works, traditions, and knowledge. It's also a sector of the economy and life that generates value in ways that are often taken for granted and often je jeopardized by the market state. And this Venn diagram, I mean, it's very simple, but the, the idea here is, is to raise our awareness that there isn't only just the government market, there is also the commons. And um, in, if we're thinking about uh, transforming cities, creating transformative cities, um, our progress may be limited in um, government and market, um, in the government because the uh, market has co-opted it to a certain extent, and an uh, old structure that moves very uh, slowly. Um, uh, the market uh, might uh, offer some problems because uh, if, 
as long as it's profit, the focus and purpose of business is to generate profit or returns for investors, um, this will compromise any sort of human transformation that can come out of that. And, um, and so the commons remains open. Um, and it's the freest and, you know, from my perspective, the freest and fastest path, path to social impact. It's, I think, the, one of the best places for designers to play and, and the best match for open design techniques. Individuals are free to organize for their mutual benefit and the role of designers is to facilitate this process. And you know, fortunately, we don't need to start from scratch. I, um, I think the foundations of sharing cities already, already exist um, and uh, many examples around the world. So there's no like one whole sh uh, sharing city who's got uh, created kind of self-provision, self-organized you know, economy and government and culture um, in every sector. Like that doesn't exist yet, but examples um, from each sector uh, exist in different cities around the world. So um, the, the idea of a shared city is a, is a concept that the building blocks already exist. Um, and so I wanna just share some examples and their kind of inspirations, uh, starting places, reference models. Uh, so crowdfunding, um, the crowd will raise an estimated $65 billion this year, and it'll create uh, uh, an estimated 2 million jobs by 2020. And by 2025, the, the crowd will invest nearly twice um, what venture capitalists will invest. And the crowd is funding art, new businesses, and urban uh, projects like this community center in Wales. So there'll be a new people-powered um, way to get what we want um, in cities, uh, for citizens to get what we want. And, uh, and you know, there are other things that uh, can help with this, like participatory budgeting. Um, so there is a kind of uh, wave of innovation in the finance space that is uh, democratizing finance. Um, and also the expenditures of, of government uh, money of tax dollars. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, participatory budgeting. It's in 1,500 cities around the world and, uh, and also growing, growing quickly. Um, in, the, in the Bay Area, um, a small town, well, not, not so small, but not one of the big towns in the Bay Area, um, Vallejo, uh, went bankrupt and are kind of building things from the bottom up. And they're the first uh, city in the United States to use participatory budget, uh, budgeting, uh, not just in one part of, or one district in the city, but for the whole city. So a really interesting experiment. And, and uh, a very big, and in, in, uh, there's uh, many participatory budgeting uh, projects in Spain, and also in, in Latin America is kind of the, the two hot spots. Um, so self-driving car networks. All the pieces for a kind of car system that operates uh, sort of like the way packets are moved through through the internet. Uh, all the makings for this exist already. And um, Get Around is a car, uh, a peer-to-peer -peer car sharing company that I'm a, I, I use occasionally. And uh, they have this offering where f they, it's a three year, $99 a month lease on a Smart 2.4. And um, you know, the average uh, Smart 2.4 in their system generates $400 a month in income. So this is a, car that pays for itself, it, you know, you can pay the $99 and then net $300 uh, as income into your household. Um, and, you know, if you kind of combine that uh, with the idea of self-driving cars, um, which is legal in California and Nevada already, um, we could, in five to ten years, have a kind of um, new sort of quasi-public trans a form of public transportation that is crowdsourced. Shared workspaces. Um, we are in an age of, uh, this is really booming. Uh, I just keep seeing more and more of these. They're super useful um, and you know, there are many. And uh, I was just, um, just at Fab Cafe and, and uh, today with, with Albert and, and uh, you've got uh, the plan in, in, uh, in Barcelona, which you probably know is that to put a, a fab lab in every district of the city. And so in the last uh, around seven years or so, something like 5,000 of these shared workspaces have, have popped up. So these are um, co-working spaces, fab labs, um, hacker spaces, um, also um, shared commercial kitchens. So this model is being applied into many different sectors. And it's a way for 
entrepreneurs and uh, to create, you know, inexpensively access the tools and, and community and knowledge they need to create new products and companies. Um, I'm part of one called uh, Impact Hub in, uh, in, uh, in San Francisco in the Soma district and it's, you know, I go once a week and it's $125 a month and uh, it's all my community there, social, uh, you know, other social entrepreneurs, social enterprises and it's a nice supportive um, community. And th this is a really cool thing happening in a market town in, in the UK, uh, Todd Morden. And uh, I cut the title short. It's, uh, they refer to themselves as incredible edible Todd Morton. And it is incredible because what they're, what they're doing is they're making food of commons there and planting um, veg veggies and all kinds of ed edibles in almost every public space possible. And there's a new book coming out about that. And uh, I think it's really cool. This, this idea of the, the, I love this picture because it's like, the plants seem to be civilizing the police there. <laughs> um, cooperatives, well, Spain, you know, of course, has famous cooperatives and a very robust cooperative sector. Um, and, uh, you know, the, and part of a global co-op movement that's uh, huge. Um, there are 800 million members of a democratic, democratically owned and operated uh, cooperatives, and this number is growing because uh, you know multinational corporations are laying off employees as fast as they possibly can, and, repl and replacing them with machines when all possible. And uh, this is an interesting model because it links um, the uh, anchor, what they call anchor institutions, um, like the city government, the hospitals, and universities, uh, to newly created cooperative enterprises built. Uh, by and, and low income communities. And in this case, they provide solar pa pa panel installation. Uh, um, it's a, a greenhouse growing lettuce and salads, salad, and, and then also a, a, one of the most green libraries in, uh, in Ohio. This is in Cleveland, Ohio. Baugruppen. Um, and, and this is people getting together to develop their own housing without a developer and keeping the cost low. Um, and also getting what they really want, not what the market uh, often dictates, which is, you know, often um, causes housing to be more expensive than it needs to be. And uh, some of the most green um, developments are develop uh, developed in this manner. But this, this is just one instance of uh, more people taking housing into their own hands through things like housing cooperatives uh, and uh, community land trusts. Um, and so that, uh, you know, we can, this is a big crisis in San Francisco over housing and um, it takes quite an effort, but this is something that citizens can self-provision with, uh, with the right willpower and, and uh, determination. And who, who's heard of Guifi? Okay, a few, I thought it would be more than that. But uh, yeah, this is a um, kind of open source uh, Wi-Fi network and, and uh, that in Spain and, it's 20,000 nodes, and it's, um, if you, you know, want to be part of the network, they have the protocol, and, you know, you build your tower and put it up, and you're off to the races, and provide you, you and your neighbors, um, you know, become part of the uh, mesh network and get internet access. And I think this is really important in the, you know, in the, these days when we've got the NSA, like, and have heavy surveillance by companies and, and, uh, well, especially governments, really, and, and, um, and also with, you know, net neutrality. So the, the, uh, the most important commons in the world is being enclosed, the Internet. Um, it's kind of, I think, of it as the master commons because it can serve every commons. And, and, uh, but it can, this can be routed around. So there, a uh, big movement in the United States, there's a lot of community wireless networks and, um, and mesh networks that, that are... Uh, uh, being incubated and built up. One, one in Oakland across the bay from where I live um, is super active and, um, and a kind of node and support um, for other uh, you know, community wireless or mesh network activists. Sikatsu Club. So one sixth of the uh, J Japanese uh, population belongs to a consumer co-op. And I, this is one of my favorite examples of it because um, you know their their slogan is stop shopping, and and um, 
And what they do, it's 90% women are the members and owners of the co-op and um, they you know, don't wanna spend time getting lost in supermarkets and spending too much for high quality goods. So they pool their buying power they, and, and they create a catalog of a limited number um, of SKUs in their inventory, just the really the basics, and and uh, you know like sixty thousand is normal for like a big box store in the U.S. So it's you know like one twentieth of that or something, and and um, and all this stuff gets delivered to their house, and they have such big uh, big buying power that they uh, they can specify you know to their manufacturers like what how to bottle it and. Uh, the quality levels, and they even got their su their suppliers to standardize their liquid, uh, the, um, any products, you know, like juices and milk, et cetera, to standardize the bottle for those, um, which uh, they were able to create really a efficient logistics based on a standard bottle for liquid, and um, and really, you know, further help cut costs and reduce waste. So, uh, so they become so successful, and it's something like 200 thousand people and almost a billion in turnover the the uh, that they um, are buying up their supplier buying up their suppliers you know kind of moving up the, the value chain and um, and then also uh, you know voting women into the diet so they've uh, uh, they really you know building power through uh, a, a kind of uh, and I mean it started with like getting together to buy milk and and so <laughs> I just think it's such an inspiring um, uh, story and also a path that I think many others can take. And then um, thinking about cities at the neighborhood scale, there are all these um, sharing micro enterprises. Um, so things like repair cafes and tool libraries and co-working spaces and uh, bicycle kitchens, community gardens, time banks, um, you know, the list goes on. and. Um, you know, we at Shareable envision a world in which, you know, every neighborhood has um, one of each. So, you know, in Barcelona, we're getting a, you're getting a fab lab in every district, and why not one of each of these in every district as well? And, and so the uh, citizens can uh, self-provision and share resources at a very local, local level um, and, uh, you know, keep the wealth at, even at the, at the neighborhood level, never mind the city level. So these are some, you know, I'm just kind of scratching the surface. I, I could, you know, I could be 50 more slides on here, but um, you know, the point that I'm trying to make and to, or, or at least hint at here is, is that, you know, most of urban economies can be mutualized, that, that can be put into the common so that uh, uh, citizens can self uh, provision as peers. And I think that really is the sort of starting point for a city that is um, a transformational space that, that uh, produces great human beings, right? Um, that we take control of the economy uh, and move from economy that in a very you know, important and real way enslaves us and takes our time and our attention and our resources. And, um, and when we take the economy in our own hand, we can start redesigning work to have more free time to spend on the things that are really important to us. Um, like our family or our religious practice, uh, building your skills uh, on education, um, on, on relationships and, and just being a citizen. Um, so let's talk about like, can this have the, uh, a kind of impact that we're, that we need, you know, uh, with the uh, deep economic and uh, environmental crises that we face, and um, there, you know, it's hard to say, but there are some hints that the, a, a kind of sharing city or an urban economy based on sharing um, can, uh, you know, do the trick or at least have, um, I think, impressive impact. And the the uh, uh, the stats that tell the story here are from car sharing because car sharing has been around for a while, so there's good data about it. Um, and the most rigorous study is done in 2010 uh, by the Transportation uh, Sustainability Research Center at Berkeley. Uh, Susan Shaheen, who's a, a friend of Shareable, um, has been you know, do, doing studies on shared use mobility for over 10 years, probably longer than that. 
Um, and uh, this study showed that for every one shared car, it replaces 13 owned cars, and that 50% of people who joined, joined to get access to a car who didn't already have access to a car. Now, a separate study um, said that for every, for every car you take off the road in a city, or uh, the ownership rolls, the, the, um, it, the city could keep um, an estimated $8,000 in the local economy. So that's a US uh, st uh, statistic. That's a, uh, the average, you know, eight or $9,000 is the average that um, a car owner in the United States pays per year. That's the cost of owning a car. And, and, uh, and so the idea is if, well, if you, you know, reduce cars in cities, then there's that money becomes disposable income that can be spent locally, right? Um, and the, and if you, re you know, if you really uh, aggressive about it, say a city put a goal to reduce the number of cars uh, in half from 250, uh, like in San Francisco, for instance, you know, there's 500,000 cars around and you reduced it by half to 250,000 then you could keep an estimated $2 billion in the local economy annually. Like that is a massive economic stimulus that just um, shifts power to the people, you know, shifts the economy towards us. Um, you know, because cars, you know, spending on cars, uh, it goes, 80% of the spending goes outside the local economy to uh, car companies, insurance companies, oil companies, right? So, um, so there's nothing, you know, like, sh you know, no solution out there like that, like that, that I know that can kind of work at, at the root cause of problems and, um, and a kind of a systemic solution that addresses multiple problems at once and in a really powerful way at, on top of it, you know, there, reduce resource consumption, increase access to resource resources, build a local economy, and depending on the kind of sharing services you have, also reweave the social fabric. So, what, so let's wind this down and come to some understanding of the moment that we're in, right? And uh, my hope is that sharing this, you know, you've got some, you know, at least some hints that you as designers um, have an important and big opportunity before you and um, because we're now an urban species, because our fate hangs on how we redesign cities, uh, the city is the design object of the 21st century. And, and what are we designing for? You know, so from my personal, the personal experience that I had in, in Brussels in 2004, um, I believe um, that we should be designing cities uh, for transformative human experiences that the product of 21st century city shouldn't be the biggest global economy possible or revival of this economy that is sputtering, uh, but the product should be the most magnificent human beings possible. And you know, if we if we get this design wrong, then I think civilization will collapse, or or it'll just not be worth living in. It'll just be this crappy place to live. And um, you know, but collapse also is a very you know, probable, I mean, historically speaking, that's the norm for civilizations to eventually collapse. Um, now, something could be different though. While that's the norm, today we have a large connected creative class with the means of production at our fingertips. Um, and uh, through sharing collaboration, ordinary people can build a sophisticated new society, one truly for the people, by the people, and I, I believe we're at a similar juncture as the Renaissance, um, when a wave of innovation moved the masses from serfdom to citizenship and, and really birthed a new kind of human being, one with a voice in society and, um, and property rights. And just as the serf couldn't imagine owning property or having a say in society, we, we don't really know what's o over the horizon quite yet. We're starting to see the outlines though but given the tools uh, at hand, I, I think it's, to, uh, it's, uh, it's time to reset our expectations for what is possible. That instead of like muddling through this cri uh, the crisis or overcoming it and you know getting back to par, you know getting back to 
level, you know, that we can, that we can use this moment to leap forward into a, a, a brand new world. And, um, and we, you know, this is the time to, re to, to design new institutions to support a new way of being in the world together, a new networked humanity with new capacities and new responsibilities, a, a humanity, humanity capable of steering us to a more joyous, resilient, and, and equitable world, one where we work together as peers to bring out everyone's genius. And, you know, what, what kind of movement can make this happen? And, you know, while we need, I think, while we need and I think it's important uh, to have movements like M15 and Occupy and Arab Spring to raise the awareness and to enter into dialogue about, uh, the, cri uh, about the crises we face, we really only have the, the formula. We need a kind of new type of activism, the, the other half, which is creative, which is about building. It's a, a movement, um, a movement for, not against, one that doesn't get bogged down in fighting the old world, but instead grows strong by building a new world, one that routes around the old world instead of confronting its strongholds. It's a movement that's not intimidated by the status quo and doesn't overblow their power um, or overestimate their power, but this is a, a movement where the people are emboldened to do better pr precisely because it is so difficult. These are people who like challenges. And uh, this movement, I think, is filled with people like you who do not fail to pick up the tools of liberation because their hands are raised uh, in anger and in protest. And, and maybe in the end, this is really not a movement. This is what we see and what I think you, you're part of. Um, it's a renaissance and, and, and everyone is invited to the party. And if it's the party and if it is a party, then designers are the hosts. So that's the end of my talk. And I want to invite you to join us tonight um, for the WeShare event that Albert has, uh, and others have put together. And we'll continue this conversation. Thank you very much. Sorry? Go ahead, go ahead. We're fine, we're fine. Um, okay, so um, any, any questions for Neil? How do you think we can cover our backs as clients, as people in the end, from big corporations utilizing this sharing movement, if you know what I mean? For example, WhatsApp. It was all free, everybody had it, then one day, boom, you gotta pay 84 cents. It's, it's sharing, and, but, but it has a backlash. How can we, designers, entrepreneurs, Again, people work around this in our favor and against this corporate world that brought you to your epiphany. Yeah, the, um, well, there's, you know, not really anything stopping like Lyft or Uber or, you know, pick your, pick your app. I mean, that model is going to continue, but we have the choice uh, to organize and finance our businesses and structure them in a different way, and people are starting to do that. Um, in the Bay Area, there's a, a company called... Uh, Local, localnomics uh, that's being incubated. And it's, it's sort of like, uh, who's heard of TaskRabbit? Anybody? Okay, so uh, TaskRabbit is like a, you know, a, uh, a marketplace to, you know, for, for people to help you do small tasks, you know, to make, do errands and stuff like that. And in and, uh, and, and that model, in the TaskRabbit model, uh, the workers compete with each other, you know, uh, to get the job and drive down the price. So it makes working, you know, the, the wage, uh, kind of issue pretty unfair, um, but Lokonomics, what they do is uh, 
the, the, the rabbits in this case, the workers in this case, are the owners of the business. So this is, will be one of the first um, uh, kind of sharing economy platforms that, that, that has a strong technology component that is also a cooperative, a worker-owned cooperative. So uh, I think we're in, um, the, 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 I think the backlash is very um, useful because it, it, it is making people ask the question that you just asked and, and they're also answering it and trying new things out, right? So um, we're, we're, we'll be covering and encouraging more of that type of thing uh, going forward. Any more questions? I think that's it. Okay, well, thanks so much. Thank you for reminding us of what's yep. important. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. Thank you.